14. Okay, uh, the Lord turned to him and say, Go in the street here have and save me. Reply mm -hmm. out of the uh, Midian's hand. I am uh, I not sending you. Uh -huh. 15. Uh, pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied out, But how can I say reply of mine? Mm -hmm. Clay is the uh, weakest in Manazi, mm -hmm. and I am the least in my family. Uh -huh. um, and uh, let's see, so how can you please read 16 and 17? Uh, Rose answered, I will be with you, mm -hmm. and you will check down all the Midian is living now alive. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gideon replied, uh -huh. If now I have found the favor in your eyes, mm -hmm. give me a sign that this is uh, really you talking to me. Uh -huh. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and the city before you. Mm -hmm. and? and the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Uh -huh. uh, James, could you please read 19 to 20? <coughs> Gideon去预备了一只山羊用一法细面做了无教饼将肉放在筐内把汤盛在壶中带到橡树下献在使者面前神的使者吩咐基甸说将肉和无教饼放在这磐石上把汤倒出来then the angel of the Lord, uh, 20, uh, 21st, 21st verse, then the angel of the Lord uh, touched the meat and the unleavened blood, uh, bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands in opera of the Abyssrites. All right, so this is a story of Gideonites. All right, so uh, in the meantime, I, uh, I want to encourage all of you to go, uh, if you don't have a book, uh, go and buy a book. Okay, uh, I'm going to announce that later at lunch today too. But um, we started with the book of uh, the um, we introduction to prophets, and the first book was Joshua. So we're going to get into that uh, later. But right now, um, I want to talk about the judges. Um, so who was uh, Gideon? So chapter 2, if you uh, open chapter 2. If you open uh, to page 10, you see Gideon. Yeah. Uh, try to buy the book because you don't want to like blame over other people. It's kind of inconvenient, right? Um, Gideon, he looks like a, a mighty warrior in this picture, right? Uh, torch in his hand and then uh, a trumpet on the other hand, right? And so uh, Gideon was one of the judges of the Israelites. So who are the judges? What were their roles? Okay, a judge, um, of course, you know, uh, as an, uh, a person adjudicates, you know, uh, you know, uh, brings, you know, uh, who who uh, treats the case. Of each person, right? Uh, of, of each case, uh, he takes care of each. Um, say that um, this person has done wrong. Uh, you have to um, compensate for the loss of the other person and all that. You know, just like uh, today's judge, they did that too. But uh, two other roles were assumed by the judges in the on uh, uh, this time. Uh, we're talking about uh, 1117 to 1115 BC. So during this period of time in Israelite. Uh, 
among the Israelites. Judges were the ones who judged the cases, but also they were the prophets. They were the like uh, uh, people who listened to God's voice and uh, represented that message to the people of God. And also they had to go to wars to fight battles. So um, Gideon, uh, he was a very shy person. I mean, who, who is withdrawn in this class? Are you kind of outgoing or withdrawn? You know, I used to be very, very withdrawn. Yeah, I was the quietest person. Like, if I go into class and leave, people will not notice because I was so quiet. And so I understand um, Gideon's situation very well. So he was a very shy person. And so uh, during this period of time, they had, uh, Israelites were oppressed by the tribe called Midianites. Midianites uh, were uh, very strong people, mighty warriors, and they would just conquer and they would just take away all their properties and you know um, uh, mistreat their people. And so um, the Israelites wanted to hide, wanted to uh, really be free from Midianites. And what they did was uh, they cried out to the Lord. So what did they do? Because they were Yahweh believers. They turned to Yahweh and started praying. God, um, why do you why do you leave the, leave us alone in, uh, under the oppression of the Midianites? Because uh, are we are we not your people? Uh, do you not care about us? And so, um, as an answer, Yahweh turned to one shy person called Gideon. Um, it's in your booklet. So, if you don't have a booklet, please uh, go ahead and buy your booklet. So here's Gideon. He was not a mighty, mighty warrior. So. He was a very shy person. He was a um, he was a farmer, and so he um, what they did was they um, were very good at making wine. So what what do you make wine out of? Any wine drinkers? All right. What do what what do you, uh, they make wine out of? Grapes. Sometimes rice, uh, but uh, oftentimes grapes, right? Yeah. So um, they gathered, I mean, uh, Gideon gathered all the grapes. And what he did was because the Midianites were, we talked about the covenant relationship between tribes, you know? One tribe might be very good at farming, but they're terrible at battling. And so other people come and conquer and take away all their harvest. And that, that was the case. Midianites would come and just take away all the Israelites' uh, harvest, including grapes. And so he hid himself in a wine press. Wine press is where all the grapes are placed on uh, the certain frame. And if you press the grapes and all the juice come, uh, you know, um, is uh, squeezed out of the grapes into a, a, a container. And then they would put, uh, put the container, you know, put all the ingredients like the sugar and all that and store it so that it will become a wine, right? Um, the, the thing is, uh, is that a wine press because he was afraid that Midianites would come and take away his harvest again. Um, he actually did this um, at a, a place where he was supposed to take care of the grains. So we just read... Verse 11 says, Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And so um, he was uh, not the grapes, he was uh, taking care of the wheat in a wine press so that the harvest will not be noticed. Right? Um, so he, he's a very scared man. You know? Have you ever done anything in secret because you were so afraid that either, I don't know, as a child, as a child, uh, either your mom or dad would come and find out, right? <laughs> or, um, I don't know, in your lifetime, did you ever do something secretly because you were afraid that you would be find, found out, you know? Uh, so Gideon was so afraid. He uh, used the uh, 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 wine press in order to get the wheat out of the, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, to, to get the uh, grains out of the wheat. Right? And so, he was a very fearful man, but all of a sudden, as the Israelites cried out to the Lord, save us from the hands of the Midianites, how God appeared before 
Gideon was very interesting. What was his first word? Chong, you just read it. What was his uh, first word? Yeah, I mean, from what we just read. The angel of the Lord appeared and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Okay, so Yahweh is with you, Gideon. You mighty warrior. Wow. To me, he doesn't look like a mighty warrior. All right? So he's hiding so that he would not be found out, right? Um, but the angel of the Lord said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Man, um, what was his response? Pardon me, Lord. You say the Lord is with me. If the Lord is with us, how did this happen? How did Midianites come and conquer us and oppress us? All right. Did you not bring us out of the Egypt from slavery for 400 years? Did you not part the Red Sea and rescue us out of that land? How come you almighty God, if you say that you are with us, like, why are we oppressed? As was this question. And uh, the angel of the Lord actually answered this question in an interesting way. Go with the strength you have and save Israel out of Midianite's hand. So, so to feeble Gideon who is hiding, you know, God is saying, mighty warrior. Go and save the Israelites out of the Midianites' hands. Wow, what is that? Right? <laughs> so, he's like, pardon me. He, he keeps saying, pardon me. He's a polite man. Pardon me, Lord. Um, I'm a very weak person. I'm very shy. <laughs> By the way, uh, I'm terrible at babbling, and uh, I'm not a warrior. Although you say that I'm a warrior. How am I supposed to save the Israelites out of the Midianites who are very strong, and they're very good at... Uh, Battling. And God says, you know what? It's not gonna be it's not gonna be by your might. I know how you're like. But when I say mighty warrior, I'm not saying that you are a mighty warrior right now. I'm saying that you are going to turn out to be a mighty warrior. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, you allow him to work through you, you become mighty, is what he's saying. So um, tell the Israelites. Get ready for battle, all right? And wake them up, get, get them ready, line them up, take them to the water, and let them drink water and uh, see how they do. Uh, and select just few, fewer people. And instead of like, taking the entire Israelite men, which is going to be still lesser than Midianites, um, instead of bringing all of them, bring just a few. And he's like, did I, did I, like, am I going crazy or did I hear, <laughs> did I hear God? So he doubted. And so what he did was, uh, was say, like, I'm sorry, Lord, but uh, I will have to test this out uh, before I carry it out as a plan because it sounds really crazy. So um, uh, show me the evidence that this is actually from you, Yahweh. And so he um, said, okay, let there be rain. And I'm going to put out my fleece, right, uh, on the ground. So what happens when you, when you put out a fleece or any kind of clothes uh, on the ground when it rains? What, what happens to the clothes? Yeah, it gets wet. The fleece is going to be wet. And so that night, it actually rained. Wow. And uh, he said, uh, let it rain and then let the fleece remain dry, which is supernatural. Then I will believe you, Lord. So that night it rained, and he went out. The fleece was dry. I was like, whoa, 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 wait a second. This is actually from the Lord, all right? But he said, you know what? I still can't believe that you want me to go out into the battlefield. Uh, I can't believe that you want me to select fewer Israelites when the Midianites are just 20. Um, show me just one more time. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off my fleece and put it on the ground, and... Let it not rain. Let it just be shiny and just like California, you know, sunny. Today it's a little bit gloomy, but other days it's like the sun is up. Oh, I splash water like I, I, I was drinking water and it, it, it slapped, splashed over my pants. But in like 20 minutes, it was all dry, right? That kind of weather. Under that sun, let the fleece be completely soaked with water. And he did that. And the 
day after he went out, the place was completely soaked with water, and the sun was just shining on the, on, in, in the sky. And so he said, you know what? I cannot deny this anymore. So I gotta do what the Lord told me to do, the craziest thing that I've ever done. So he's like, okay, let me put on my um, armor and try to gather the Israelites out if they don't listen to me, you know? <laughs> and then he went down and he actually said, uh, uh, my dear family and relatives and Israelites, you know, this is what the Lord said, and so uh, why don't you go and, you know, prepare for a, a war? <laughs> and surprisingly, they listened. Why? Because when uh, Gideon obeyed the Lord, the power of the Lord came upon him, and people could see, and so they obeyed, right? This shy, weak person, they listened to him. And so what did he become? He became the judge. So we're talking about the book of Judges. A judge was a, a person who judged the cases, but also uh, they were prophets, and they, um, they had to fight the battles. So they were generals too, so those three roles. Okay, so Gideon became a judge. And what happened? Um, the Lord has said, what? Prepare for a war, war, bring all the Israelites' men, take them by the water, let them drink water, and see what they do. And some people <laughs> were just uh, kneeling down and just drinking like this, uh, because Israelite, you know, uh, Israel is a uh, very hot place. And other people actually uh, took water and then did this. Uh, it means they were more alert, they were ready, uh, if, you know, they were alert to see if other enemies might be cunning. And so, just like those, those people, you know. First of all, <clears throat> call all the men and say, we're gonna go fight the war, you might die. If you're afraid, go home, you know. <laughs> and two thirds of the men went home. All right, who, who wants to lose their life, right? They went home, they're like, Wait a minute, where, where did all these men go? Lord, oh, what am I going to do? And he says, still you have too many. If you, if you go with all your force, I'm afraid that you're going to say, we won the Midianites, won over the Midianites by our own power. No, I want you to know that I am Yahweh, I'm El, El Shaddai, I'm the Almighty God, who makes the battle, uh, who makes you win, or makes the other you know, enemy win. So I'm the one who is in charge. I want you to learn that lesson. So therefore, send people away. So go to the water and do this testing. And so more people were dropped. All right, oh, still too many. All right, just select those few people. And so Gideon finally had only 300 people. All right, so that's like 100 to one. All right, Midianites were many. And so, can you, like, can you imagine, even if you're a very strong person and who is a trained, mighty warrior, if you fight 10 people, wouldn't you be tired? You know? <laughs> Have you seen, like, the Chinese Kung Fu movies? Or, like, you know, <laughs> those movies? Or Lord of the Rings, you know? <laughs> or any battle scene? Have you seen, like, one person fighting against, like, 10? Wow! That's tiring, right? But this situation is a like one versus a hundred. And the Lord did it intentionally. And so, you know what, Gideon? I want you to do one thing. Welcome. I want you to do one thing. All right? So, uh, bring a torch uh, and then a trumpet. All right? And uh, let all the Israelites hold onto a torch. Okay? And uh, at nighttime, uh, go and actually sneak, sneak it and uh, just uh, start the battle. So, cover your torch. So, that's why he's holding a torch in your picture, right? Cover your torch with a jar, like a, you know, so that it will be hidden, like no, no lights, okay? And then the other hand, you bring a trumpet. And then hide and sneak in, and all of a sudden, you shout, okay, you, you blow the trumpet, and let the Israelites shout, and take out the torch, all right? That's all you have to do. What kind of plan is that? Okay, so there are so many millions that are going to come and just, you know, wipe them out, right? But he obeyed, all right, because it's the Lord's call. And so he did this stupid thing uh, to, uh, and all the Israelites obeyed. And they went to fight the Midianites, and they took off the jars, and they blew the trumpets, and the Midianites were like, wow, what is this? Oh, 
you know, you know, so many tribes are coming to attack us that they're wiping us out. So they started running, all right? And uh, they started fighting each other. They were so confused. They, they were fighting each other. And they were all wiped out that day. Say, if Gideon had 300 people, Midianites were 30,000. They were wiped out that day. And so the angel of the Lord, his word was fulfilled. He said, the Lord is with you, was his uh, first word. The Lord is with you. I am with you. And, by the way, you are a mighty warrior. So this shy person who used to hide in the wine press or hide in the, um, you know, uh, threshing, uh, threshing field, he became a mighty warrior. Not only that, God showed that he was with the Israelites. And so, um, why is this in the story of the judges? This is very significant. What it means is that um, we need to put our trust in Yahweh, who is ultimately the Messiah, right? And when we do that, we don't live our lives according to our own might and our own wisdom anymore. It's the Lord who gives us the power and the wisdom. And he shows us what we are supposed to do and, and what we're not supposed to do. So our life becomes much simpler because we're not figuring out things on our own. It's not that we're just, uh, we may just sit there and do nothing. I'm not saying that. But what we need to do in obedience to Yahweh is, is, is to listen to him and follow his plan. And his plan for <coughs> everyone is because he created each one of you. It's good. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to see his glory. And to, to do that, it takes uh, step of faith. It takes faith. Gideon had to believe and he had to take an action of faith. And so um, that's what we learned this morning. All right, so turn to your books. Once again, um, if you don't have books, please go and get your books from the front desk. Um, so back to chapter one, uh, we spent some time um, learning about the background of the Old Testament because otherwise rest of the books don't make sense, right? And so we talked about it. And now the first book among the prophets in the Old Testament is called the Book of Joshua. Book of Joshua. All right, so turn to page five. Oh, turn to page four. Joshua, what is the historical a historical background? Um, Moses, the great leader, uh, the Moses, uh, the great leader. Uh, the, uh, in Hebraic pronunciation, he would say Moshe. I drew him out of water. He was a Hebraic, uh, he, a Hebrew boy who was uh, uh, under just a genocide of all the boys under two years old by Pharaoh of Egypt, and he was rescued. His, his mom tried to save him by keeping him for three months, but after that, you, know, you can't really hide a baby because he starts crying, right? So finally, she had to make a decision, put him in a box, um, and then she had to put him on the uh, Nile River so that it would just flow away, and she just prayed. And it happened to arrive at where uh, Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, was uh, taking a bath. 
Okay? And she picked up the box and opened the box and, whoa, this little baby, he, she already had a son who was the next king, next pharaoh. And um, she saw the baby, oh, this, is a, this must be a Hebrew baby and, um, yeah, um, someone must have uh, tried to rescue him. I'm going to uh, take him in and raise him as my own son. So she adopted him. And so he grew up in palace. Uh, but uh, later when he became older, he was called by God. And so he left Egypt. He led all the Israelites out of Egypt from slavery. And um, he led them throughout the wilderness in order to enter into the promised land. Uh, now... Moses became very old, and he was dying. So, but um, he had a mentee. He was like a mentor, right? He was raising up the next generation leaders. One of them was Joshua. So there's the book of Joshua. Joshua was the second generation leader uh, who was born in the wilderness. So uh, the book of Joshua begins right upon Moses' death, and it shows God's faithfulness to the covenant. So the book of Joshua, what is it about? Of course, it's about the journey of the Israelites uh, starting, you know, uh, in the wilderness, trying to enter into the promised land, you know, facing many difficulties, but God shows his faithfulness over and over again. And that's the book of Joshua. And so um, we're going to, okay, before we watch a brief video, video, the name Joshua, Yehoshua, what does it mean? Are you, are you kind of familiar with Hebrew? No. Not really? Is your language completely different? Different. Different, okay. So, Yehoshua means Yahweh is salvation. So, the person, the leader's name, Joshua, means uh, Yehoshua. And Joshua is a, an English pronunciation, so uh, it's a little bit confusing sometimes. But his uh, real name is Yehoshua, and that means Yahweh is salvation. Mm. And so, uh, the theological themes. All right, uh, Chong, could you please read uh, theological theme? The two. Yes. <coughs> okay. Theological theme: uh, three men and director of, of Joshua. Uh, God, so seven Joshua and people of uh, Israel. Right. So Hosea. To Joshua, okay, so the both names are the same. The Lord saves, or the Lord gives victory, or the Lord is salvation, right? So the book of Joshua is the beginning of the former prophets, and uh, the history of the uh, Israel is recorded in prophetic perspective. So, um, who is the author? Suha, can you please read the author section? Uh, Joshua, the final section is the consider to be. Written by uh, Eliezer. Eliezer, son of uh, Aaron, mm -hmm. a man in whom is the spirit. That's right. A little show slavery in Egypt. Witness the supernatural plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. One of the twelve sp uh, species. Spies. Uh, spies. Uh -huh. God's chosen. Servant to lead the rush uh, Israel, Israel into the promised land, the leader of God's army, mm -hmm. the administrator of God's division of the land, and uh, as God's spokesman, mm -hmm. a type of Christ. Oh, a type of Christ. Yeah, yes. so Joshua. Uh, as a person, so I, I talked about the four shadows, right? So there are trees in the parking lot right now, and when the sun shines, then we see shadows of the trees on the ground, right? And so by looking at the uh, tree shadows on the ground, we can say, oh, yeah, it must be a tree, and tree is behind me, right? And when we see a uh, uh, foreshadow of a, like a shadow of a dog, we, we can say, oh, you know, it's a furry dog. Uh, and when you see a shadow of a car, then we can pretty much tell, oh, it's a car, right? So in the Old Testament era, uh, Jesus was not born yet. The Messiah was not born yet. And people only heard of the prophetic words about the Messiah to come. And those prophetic words were like the shadows. 
right? And so Michelle will be like this, Michelle will be like that. He is gonna live his life, life like this. He's going to do this and he's going to die and be resurrected. Okay, so these are pro prophesied. However, um, there were also people who represented, like who, who were like a little bit like the Messiah to come. God picked certain people, um, so, such as Joshua. He was a man, he was a general commander, you know, he was a leader um, who obeyed God. Who, uh, he was a mentee of Moses, okay? um, but throughout his life, in obedience to God um, and his, in his leadership, he demonstrated the characteristics of the Messiah to come. So he was a type of Christ. So there are several types of Christ throughout the Old Testament. So um, in summary, what does it all mean? All right, um, It may be a little bit too much for those who um, are not familiar with the Bible. So that's why I show you a, kind of a summary story sometimes so that you will um, understand better. The book of Joshua. Let's back up and remember the story so far. So God chose Abraham, and then his family became the people of Israel, who are then enslaved down in Egypt. So through Moses, God rescued Israel out of Egypt. He made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai, and he brought them through the wilderness. So Israel then camped outside the promised land, and Moses called them to obey God's commands so that they could show all the other nations what God is like. The book of Joshua picks up right after Moses has died, and Israel's ready to enter the land. So the story of Joshua is designed with four main <coughs> movements. Joshua first leads Israel into the Promised Land, and then once they're there, they meet all this hostility from the Canaanites, and so they engage them in battle. Then after their victories, Joshua divides up the Promised Land as the inheritance for the 12 tribes, and then the book concludes with these final speeches that Joshua gives to the people. So let's dive in, and we'll see how all of it flows together. The first section begins with Moses' death, and Joshua is appointed as Israel's new leader. And the author intentionally presents Joshua as a new Moses. So like Moses, Joshua calls the people to obey the Torah, which is the covenant commands that they were given at Mount Sinai. And then Joshua sends spies into the land, just as Moses did back in Numbers chapters 13 and 14. Except it goes way better this time. In fact, even some Canaanites turn and follow the God of Israel. Joshua then leads all Israel across the Jordan River and into the land. Just like the sea parted from Moses in the Exodus, so here the river Jordan parts and the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant across, leading all of Israel with them. Now, in chapter 5, the story transitions. So the people look back to their roots as God's covenant people, and so the new generation is circumcised and they celebrate their first Passover in the land. But then they turn and prepare to go forward. And Joshua has this crazy encounter with a mysterious warrior, who, it turns out, is the angelic commander of God's army. And Joshua asks, are you for us, or are you for our enemies? And the warrior responds, neither. Which shows that the real question here is whether Joshua is on God's side. It makes clear that this whole story is not about Israel versus the Canaanites. Rather, this is God's battle. And Israel is going to play the role of spectators or sometimes supporters in God's plan, which leads to the next section. We find stories about all these conflicts that Israel had with different Canaanite groups. And the first part retells the story of two battles in detail, and that's followed by a series of short stories that condense years of battles into a few brief summaries. So the first two battles are against Jericho and then Ai. And they offer these contrasting portraits of God's faithfulness versus Israel's failure. At Jericho, Israel is to take a completely passive approach. So they let God's presence in the ark lead them around the city to music for six days. And just like Rahab turned to the God of Israel, maybe the people of Jericho would do the same, but they don't. 
And so on the seventh day, the priests blow the trumpets and the walls come falling down, leading Israel to victory. The point of the story is that God is the one who will deliver his people. Israel simply needs to trust and wait. Now the next story of the battle at Ai makes the opposite point. So there's this Israelite named Achan, and he steals from Jericho some of the devoted goods that were to belong to God alone, and then he lies about it. It's a pretty lame move after all that God has done for Israel. And so Israel goes into battle with the city of Ai, and they're totally defeated. And it's only after humble repentance and severely dealing with Khan's sin that Israel gains victory. And so together, these two stories, they're placed right up front to make an important point. If Israel is going to inherit the land, they have to be obedient and trust in God's commands. They don't get special treatment. Now, the second part of this section begins with the Gibeonites, a Canaanite people group, and they do just what Rahab did, as they turn to follow the God of Israel and they make peace with Israel. This is in contrast to all of these other Canaanite kings who start to form alliances and coalitions, and they want to destroy Israel. So Israel engages them in battle, and they win by a landslide. And so this whole section concludes with this summary list of all of these victories won by Moses and then by Joshua. Now, let's stop for a second, because odds are that these stories and the violence in them, they're going to bother you. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're bound to wonder, like, didn't Jesus say to love your enemies? Why is God declaring war here? So first, why the Canaanites? The main reasons are actually given earlier in the biblical story, is that the culture of the Canaanites had become extremely morally corrupt, especially when it comes to sex. Go check out Leviticus chapter 18. They also widely practiced child sacrifice. Go see Deuteronomy chapter 12. And so God didn't want these practices to influence Israel. The Canaanites had to go. Which raises the second question. Did God actually command the destruction of all the Canaanites, like a genocide? So at first glance, you know, you look at the phrases used in these stories. They totally destroyed them. They left no survivor or anything to breathe. But when you look a second time, more closely, you'll see that these phrases are clearly hyperbole and not literal. So go back to the original command about the Canaanites in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Israel is first told to drive out the Canaanites, but then to totally destroy them. And then that's followed by commands to not intermarry with them or enter into business deals with them. So you can't marry someone that you've destroyed. I think you get the point. The same idea applies to the stories in Joshua. Look closely. So for example, we're told in Joshua chapter 10 that Israel left no survivors in the cities of Hebron or Debir. But then later, in chapter 15, we see these towns and they're still populated by Canaanites. And so what we're seeing is that Joshua fits in with other ancient battle accounts by using non-literal hyperbolic language as part of the narrative style. And so the word genocide doesn't actually fit what we see here, especially in light of the stories about the Canaanites who did turn to the God of Israel, like Rahab or the Gibeonites. God was open to those who would turn to him. The last thing to think about is that these stories mark a unique moment in Israel's history. These battles were limited to the handful of people groups living in the land of Canaan. With all other nations, Israel was commanded by God to pursue peace. Go read Deuteronomy chapter 20. So the purpose of these battle stories was never to tell you, the reader, to go commit violence in God's name. Rather, they show God bringing his justice on human evil at a unique moment in history, and how he delivered Israel from being annihilated by the Canaanites. Now, let's go back to the book's design. After years of battles, we see an aging Joshua, and he starts dividing up the land for the twelve tribes of Israel. And most of this section is like lists of boundary lines. And let's be honest, it's kind of boring. It's like reading a map that has no pictures. But for the Israelites, these lists were super important. This was the fulfillment of God's ancient promises to Abraham, that his descendants would inherit the promised land. And so now it was all coming to pass right down to the detail. Which leads to the final section. Joshua gives two speeches to the people that are very similar to the final speeches of Moses in Deuteronomy. Joshua reminds them of God's generosity, how he brought them into the land and rescued them from the Canaanites. And so he calls them to turn away from the Canaanite gods and be faithful to the covenant they made. If they do, 
it will lead to life and blessing in the land. But if they're unfaithful, Israel will call down on itself the same divine judgment that the Canaanites experienced. They'll be kicked off the land into exile. And so Joshua leaves Israel with a choice. What is Israel going to do? That's the big question that looms as the story ends, and that's the book of Joshua. Does it help you? Generally, what the theme is, right? The book of Joshua is about um, if you do this, you're going to be blessed. If you do that, you're going to be cursed. Um, if you're on my side, I. If you're on my side, so it's not a matter of if God is on my side. Sometimes, you know, do we pray to God, you know, oh, something bad happened. Can you please take care of the situation? Can you resolve the problem? You know? Or, oh, I uh, just lost a job. Can you find me a job? You know? Or, can you give me some more money because, you know, I need to feed my family or something? You know? Or, um, oh, can you please give me the brain that I don't have so that, you know, when I just uh, crash through uh, these materials like overnight, uh, can you give me good great uh, GPA or good um, score so that I can not only pass, but, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, get a good GPA and get a scholarship or something like that, right? Sometimes we, we, we try to turn to God as if he's like a vending machine. Maybe if we put some coins in, you know, do the rituals, I don't know, and then uh, the, the thing that we want is going to come out. You know, a lot of the uh, religions in the world are like that, you know? There's no personal relationship, but, you know, if I do the right thing, like the right stuff, you know, put some coins in and, you know, just uh, press the buttons, then I'll get what I want. That's not about uh, Christianity. Christianity is about a relationship. It's not a religion, but it's a relationship. Okay, and so um, God cares about. His, he wanted. He created the human beings because He is in three persons. I'm not talking about three gods, but one God, but in three different modalities: um, Father, Holy Spirit, and His uh, the, the Son, Son of God. So three in one, uh, one God. And so they're in perfect, harmonious, and love relationship. And so God wanted to, because it was so good, wanted to duplicate that relationship by creating human beings. So do you know that, um, according to, if you read the book of Genesis, you, you'll find it very clearly, that God created human beings so that he can have a love relationship with them, love, harmonious relationship. And so that relationship, uh, was messed up in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve rebelled against God. Um, and sin and death and suffering came into the picture, in the, into the world that used to be perfect. But God did not want to wipe out, you know, just people and, 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 and um, change his plan. He, he still wanted to save them. He still wanted to uh, give them life and everlasting life. Do you know that there is a life after we die? So, let me see the show of your hands. Anybody in this classroom, you can be honest. <laughs> All right, and I, I can prophesy uh, over this one matter. Is there anybody who's not going to die? Nobody, right? Right? Everyone is going to die. We're, we're, we know from childhood, we, we, we grow old, we, we see our grandparents, and oh, okay, human beings grow old and they die, right? Um, so that's that's given. But uh, when we physically die, do you know that there is an eternal life? Our spirit don't die. They live forever. And which place you want to live is your own choice. <coughs> so if you're in that, if you respond to God's call to be in the perfect love relationship with Him, if you respond to that, then you're going to be in one place where your spirit is in his presence, uh, which is glorious and loving, and there's joy, complete peace, uh, no sickness, no suffering, no loneliness, no brokenness. Or if you deny that call, you might end up being in a different place where there's totally suffering and hopelessness and all the things that, that we experience on this earth that is negative and bad and 
not a blessing, times a thousand. And so uh, God's plan is to save everyone. So the book of Joshua that we we're talking about, we we're talking about God is salvation. And so he's giving us this cheat sheet called the Bible. Okay, so have you ever had like a professor from your college, you know, who would give you an exam, but like uh, two weeks before, he gives you all the study materials, like, okay, study this, and my exam is going to be just based on this. Have you had those like kind, generous professors, you know? Would you like that? Or some, some professors actually, I, give, <laughs> okay. um, give you like an open book test. Are you like not joyful? Like you don't have to cram in all the things, but your book is right there. If you only know like which page to turn to, you're gonna get all the answers right, right? Even if it's essay. Don't you like, like those professors? So God is like an open book test kind of person. Cheat sheet giving God, all right, who gives you uh, the Bible so that you will know all the right answers in order to go to heaven, in order to live a blessed life on this earth. Because he wants to bless everyone. So here, here, because I'm the creator, you know, don't you have to play the sports according to uh, whoever is in charge? You know, like say in uh, Olympic Games. How many of you watch Olympics? All right. So yeah. So um, if it's I don't know uh, soccer, there are rules, right? And if if it's a track meet, you know, there's a rule. Like you have to start at the after the you know. Uh, what do you call it? The, the, uh, I mean, you, you have to start right after, uh, after that, not before, right? Otherwise, you get disqualified. And, uh, you have to, you, you cannot like uh, push other people over while you're running, all right? You better stay in your track. And uh, there are certain rules, right? And uh, you can't do this in order to grab onto the finish line, but you have to, you know, use your chest in order to arrive at. There are rules, right? And in soccer games, like if you, if you violate the rules so many times, you get a, at first, yellow card, and then finally, red card, and you have to, you cannot play anymore, right? And so, you have to play according to how the game was designed, and how it's going to, how the rules are going to implement it during that game, right? And so, God is like the one who designed this, you know, who uh, designed this game. We're, we're in a race. So I'm just using, using a metaphor. Uh, if you were like a game, he's like the game designer. And he is the one who uh, actually reinforces the rules. And so he's saying, all right guys, I love you. I want every one of you to win. I don't want any losers. That's not my intention. So here are the rules and here's how you can keep it. And by the way, I'm not expecting perfection. I, I understand that human beings are not perfect. So you turn to me, just like Gideon, that we talked about this morning, all right? Just like Joshua, you know, in the battle of Jericho, you know, all that, like, it, it was not by their own might and their wisdom, but rather because they turned to the word of God, they listened and obeyed, right? So okay. listen by turning to the, to what I said. The answers are here. The she 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 is here. If you follow all this, try or just try your best and ask me for help, I will help you. If you just go one step forward, I'm gonna come nine steps forward to just help you, right? And in this race, it's not like the race in the world. Like you don't have to outsmart other people. You don't have to outrun other people. You just listen and follow what I said. Just like Gideon had to hide his torch under a jar, you know, and bring a trumpet and just blow it. You follow what I said. Then you're going to experience victory and you're going to be the champion. By the way, it does not have to be one person wins and other people all become like losers. No. Um, of course, you, you want to go for the medals, right? Gold medal in the Olympic Games. But there are multiple, multiple gold medalists. Only if you obey me is what he's saying. All the answers are here, all the rules are here. So it's an open book, guys. Turn to it and I'll give you victory, is the message of the book of Joshua, all right? Now, um, turn to page eight. I know we 
spent quite a bit of time in the uh, uh, chapter one because chapter one is long and it's important, you know, uh, that background was needed. But we're moving on. So chapter two. All right, so Tom, please, uh, could you please read the learning objectives for us? Learning objectives? We want to bring the same as well, but the judges? The judges? Judges, in the reason this book in is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And to know the historical uh, background behind the church. Mm -hmm. And three, describe the uh, detail of the uh, church. And four, describe uh, the, uh, the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Just uh, the right. um, negative and the side. Significance? Significant of each. Right. And number five, mm -hmm. the cover and explain. Uh, uh, four, four shadows. Four shadows. Four shadow of um, Messiah. Messiah in the book of uh, Joshua. Uh -huh. Americans call him Messiah, but it's the same thing. Could you please read uh, uh, row number one, Judges? The people refused to run either as the royal, mm -hmm. the ex elders who ultimated the Joshua until the tenth of the money monarchy. Monarchy. Uh -huh. monarchy. That's right. Okay, so should we read uh, two? Yes. <coughs> to author, the tradition states that the author of the judges is Samuel, uh -huh. writing during the monarchy. Right. So judges were written by, um, you know, the traditional states that it's Samuel, the prophet. All right. Okay. And number three, theme and theology, so how? Okay. <coughs> uh, stars from the death of Joshua to the rise of the monarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, account of frequent apostasy, mm -hmm. provo uh, provoking divine uh, chest uh -huh. Urgent appears to God in, ta in times of crisis, mm -hmm. moving the law to rise up judges, mm -hmm. restoration of the land to peace. That's right. So we briefly talked about this uh, in the morning. Um, those who were here um, on time, we, we talked about um, the judges. Um, that uh, this starts from death of Joshua until rise of kings. So in between Joshua and kings, there were leaders called judges and we're talking about that period of time right um and, uh, what's your name again oh ayaka 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 that's right <coughs> can you please read the next section the um uh, after the bullet points upon upon and <laughs> entering into the promised land mm -hmm. of the covenant covenant pro Promise were fulfilled. Fulfilled. Oh, time for the Israelites. Israelites to establish themselves firm, firmly in the land. Uh, driving out the golden tribes. Tribes. Mm -hmm. You're doing good, Israel. Uh, for getting the act of God and their identity as God's people. Mm -hmm. Identity as God's people <coughs> and? The Godship and the kingship of the God in it. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh's? Yahweh's <coughs> covenant, faithfulness, despite Israelites' uh, obedience, right? And let me finish. I got spirit bringing victory in war against the foreign kingdoms. Okay, so these are the uh, themes and um, the general theology behind um, this this book. Boy, can you please read the next section uh, based on First Kings six one? Oh, 
Based on the first King six one, right? At the bottom, at, at page eight. Oh, yes. Lesson one key, six one. Mm -hmm. um, in total, four hundred eighty years between the Exodus and the Forest. Years of servants reading. Mm -hmm. The period, period of judges considered between C. Uh, 1380 and uh, Lies of South Sea. That's right. That's right. And um, can you please read uh, section number four, Judges? Oh, me? Yes. Section number four, Judges. Okay, Judges. Deborah? Deborah, huh? Oh, Deborah. Mm -hmm. One of the major judges, mm -hmm. meaning, what is it? Charismatic. Charismatic leaders. That are very political figures mm -hmm. in the story of how Israel takes the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. The only female judge, mm -hmm. a prophet, mm -hmm. critical role in defeating of Canaanites. Canaanites. Uh -huh. Wife of the man, Lapdoth, uh -huh. and Fire Woman. Fire Woman. Mm -hmm. Samos Barak to be her general. Mm -hmm. Barak's powerful uh -huh. response. Mm -hmm. Victory won due to a um, Kenite woman jail killing Cicera. The song? Okay, the song of Deborah. Judge by mm -hmm. because Miriam mm -hmm. and uh, foreshadows let a woman who celebrate David's military success. success. All right, all right. So um, some of you actually said that um, you are here to um, practice English or uh, make friends or both, you know, or get something out of the class. So uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity if you. Uh, just listen to me. I mean, it's going to be helpful in some way, but um, if you practice by actually talking to each other, although you may not be perfect, you know, um, then that's when you learn. That's when you learn from each other and learn from each other's perspectives, possibly make friends, <coughs> um, and uh, you know, use the vocabulary words that you know or learn new vocabulary. So that's what I'm going to do um, for you right now. So why don't you pair up two or three people in your group? Nobody should be remaining alone. All right. So why don't you form groups of two or three? And I'm going to show you uh, a video and then I'm going to give you the discussion questions. So like uh, each group will have a spokesperson. Okay. And uh, we'll will um, answer uh, one of the questions. Okay, is that, is that good? So I'll give you a chance for a discussion so that you can practice English. All right, so. Um. The book of Judges. So remember, after Joshua led the tribes of Israel into the Promised Land, he called them to be faithful to their covenant with God by obeying the commands of the Torah. And if they do this, they will show all the other nations what God is like. So Judges begins with the death of Joshua and basically tells the story of Israel's total failure. The book's name comes from the type of leaders Israel had in this period. Before they had any kings, the tribes were all governed by these judges. Now don't think of a courtroom. These were regional political military leaders, more like a tribal chieftain. And you need to be warned, the book of Judges is very disturbing and violent. It tells the tragic tale of Israel's moral corruption, of its bad leadership, and basically how they become no different than the Canaanites. But this sad story is also meant to generate hope for the future. And you can see this in how the book's designed. There's a large introduction that sets the stage for Israel's failure <coughs> to film, drive out the remaining Canaanites. Then the large main section of the book has stories about the growing corruption of Israel's judges. And the progression here shows how Israel's leaders go from pretty good to okay to bad to worse. The concluding section is really disturbing. And
and shows the corruption of the people of Israel as a whole. So let's dive in, and we can explore each part a bit more. The opening section begins with the tribes of Israel in their territories in the Promised Land. And while Joshua defeated some key Canaanite towns, there was still a lot of land to be taken and lots of Canaanites living in those areas. And so chapter 1 gives a long list of Canaanite groups and towns that Israel just failed to drive out from the land. Now, remember, the whole point of driving out the Canaanites was to avoid their moral corruption and their way of worshipping the gods through child sacrifice. God had called Israel to be a holy people, and that does not happen. Chapter 2 describes how Israel just moved in alongside the Canaanites and adopted all their cultural and religious practices. And it's right here that the story stops. For nearly a whole chapter, the narrator gives us an overview of everything that's about to happen in the body of the book. This part of Israel's history, the narrator says, was a series of cycles moving in a downward spiral. So Israel became like the Canaanites, and so they would sin against God. So God would allow them to be conquered and oppressed by the Canaanites, and eventually the Israelites would see the error of their ways and repent. So God would raise up a deliverer, a judge, from among Israel who would defeat the enemy and bring about an era of peace. But eventually Israel would sin again and it would all start over. This cycle provides the literary design and flow for the next main section of the book. It gets repeated for each of the six main judges whose stories are told here. Now the stories of the first three judges, Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah, they are epic. Adventures. They're also extremely bloody stories. Either the judge themselves or people who helped the judge, they defeat their enemies and deliver the people of Israel. The stories about the next three judges are longer, and they focus in on the character flaws of the judges, which get increasingly worse. So Gideon, he begins pretty well. He's a coward of a man, but he eventually comes to trust that God can save Israel through him. And so he defeats a huge army of Midianites with only 300 men carrying torches and clay pots. But Gideon has a nasty temper, and he murders a bunch of fellow Israelites for not helping him in his battle. And then it all goes downhill from there. He makes an idol from the gold that he won in his battles, and then after he dies, all Israel worships the idol as a god, and the cycle begins again. The next main judge is Jephthah, who's something of a mafia thug living up in the hills. And when things get really bad for Israel, the elders come to him, begging for his help. And Jephthah was a very effective leader. He won lots of battles against the Ammonites, but he was so unfamiliar with the God of Israel, he treats him like a Canaanite god. He vows to sacrifice his daughter if he wins the battle. This tragic story, it shows just how far Israel has fallen. They no longer know the character of their own God, which leads to murder and the false worship. The last judge, Samson, is by far the worst. His life began full of promise, but he has no regard for the God of Israel. He was promiscuous, violent, and arrogant. He did win brutally strategic victories over the Philistines, but only at the expense of his own integrity, and his life ends in a violent rush of mass murder. Now, a quick note here. You'll notice a repeated theme in the main section of the book, that at key moments, God's Spirit will empower each of these judges to accomplish these great acts of deliverance. Now, the fact that God uses these really screwed up people doesn't mean he endorses all or even any of their decisions. God is committed first and foremost to saving his people, but all he has to work with is these corrupt leaders. And so work with them, he does. This whole section is designed to show just how bad things have gotten. You can't even tell the Israelites and the Canaanites apart anymore. And that's just the leaders. The final section shows Israel as a whole hitting bottom. There are two tragic stories here, and they are not for the faint of heart. They're structured by this key line that gets repeated four times at the close of the book. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The first story is about an Israelite named Micah, who builds a private temple to an idol. And that gets plundered by a private army sent from the tribe of Dan. So they come, and they steal everything, and then they go and <coughs> burn down the peaceful city of Laish and murder all of its inhabitants. Horrifying story. When Israel forgets its God, might makes right. The final story of the book is even worse. It's a shocking tale of 
sexual abuse and violence, which all leads to Israel's first civil war. It's very disturbing. And that's the point. These stories are meant to serve as a warning. Israel's descent into self-destruction is a result of turning away from the God who loves them and saved them out of slavery in Egypt. And now, Israel needs to be delivered again from themselves. The only glimmer of hope in this story is found in this repeated line in the last part of the book. It actually forms the last sentence of the story. Israel has no king. And so the stage is set for the following books to tell the origins of King David's family, the book of Ruth, and also the origins of kingship itself in Israel, the book of 1 Samuel. But the story of Judges has value as a tragedy. It's a sobering explanation of the human condition, and ultimately it points out the need for God's grace to send a king who will rescue his people. And that's the book of Judges. All right, so turn to each other and go over these questions. All right, two to three in your group? Yeah. I'll give you uh, about 10 minutes to discuss them. And then after that, um, each group is going to represent, you know, um, talk about what they found out. I know you're not the closest friends, but um, this is an opportunity when you get to know people. All right, introduce yourselves. All right, so pair up two or three people and um, go for it. not be uh, watching me, but rather talk to each other. <laughs> All right? But it's your time. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Ye
take that into your own hands and your mind. And um, one of the things that we did was uh, to listen to God, to try to point out and deliver that message to the people of the people. So they were prophets. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the book of Judges is part of the prophets. Because it's about the prophets. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We just covered number two, too. Right? Oh, number
in the gym. Oh, okay. So in the gym and then and go home. And <laughs> okay. decide. Uh -huh. They decided. Oh, the decisions <coughs> over cases. Good. All right. Yes. And uh, what what about uh, what about God's word to the Israelites? Like, what was the key? The key, key message. Key. I think you, you were on the right point. Like a, the key message. Like what kind of message did they hear from God and tell? Okay. To obey, yeah. So whatever you're doing, if there's something wrong, like immorality, corruption, you know, um, hating each other, you know, um, worshiping false gods, don't do it because you already know the answers. You're, you're supposed to know better. Don't do it against God's will because God does not want to punish you, but he has to because he's the righteous judge. You know, he has to punish the ones who sin against God. But he doesn't want you to sin and get the punishment that you deserve. Um, it, God is like, God is like this. How many, how many of you have strict moms? Strict moms. Like moms, like tiger, tiger moms. <laughs> <laughs> I have a tiger mom. Mm -hmm. All right. So, what do they do? I mean, Asian moms are really strong, right? <laughs> they look really, you know, feminine and weak, but oh, you know, like, oh, if you do the wrong thing, I'm going to just smack you, right? Yeah? Something in your tiger mommy and something in your This is there, that's right. They're, they're very nice over the phone. Hello. You know, and then they turn around and they're like, go back to your room and then study, you know? So I have that kind of mom. So um, I talked about this before, but because there are several of you who are kind of new, I'm going to just uh, refresh the memory and uh, tell you the, the story that you haven't heard. All right, so uh, I talked about a tiger mom, you know, <laughs> washing our dishes and she is cooking for dinner and uh, upstairs, what are you doing? Um, say you're a teenager, okay? So you're playing video games. And uh, actually, uh, the day after tomorrow is your final exam. And so you better be studying. <laughs> and so uh, mommy saying, all right, Joanne, uh, all right, so cool, cool. Yeah, cool. Oh, you know, <laughs> study, study for your finals exam, and you're like, I don't know, maybe a football game. <laughs> cool. Oh, you should just hear your, the noise, you know, video game noise. All right, Cole, put your game away and study for biology. And you hate biology. Yes, mom. And then, you know, so she's like, Cole, you you heard me say, put it away and start studying. You know, otherwise I'm gonna come and smack you, all right? And I'm like, yes, mom. And then you still play. Oh, she she knows. All right, cool. I already told you three times. I'm gonna count to ten, and you better put it away and behave, all right? So, she's saying one, and you're still playing two. So, oh yeah, so she's really mad. So she's coming up the stairs. Three. You know, she's making her noise louder so that you can hear, but you, you can't hear because you're playing games. Go, I told you to stop playing the games and start studying. Uh, okay, mom, four, you know, and then she goes seven, eight. You know, when she says eight, what do you think is going on in her mind? Do you think she's like, oh, you know, I finally get to smack <laughs> my child, no? Do you think that that's what she's thinking? No! Why is she counting? Why is she repeating the message? Tiger mom power. <laughs> because Tiger Mom wants you to fix it and don't get punished. It's for your own good. Because if you study, then you're gonna get a good score, right? And you're gonna go to go to the college that you want, right? And so she's like, come on, hey! And she's like, oh, you know what? Put it away! But she, she's mad, but she's sad for you too. Like, put it away! I told you. And then she goes, nine! And she's almost at the door. And you're like, you're still playing. And you saw her. <laughs> and then she goes, nine and a half! Why? She could have gone, you know, when we were playing games like out uh, hide and seek when we were little. We go like, okay, you're you supposed to count to 50, right? 40, 45, 40, 50, you know, and you, you go and start finding. But your mom is like, nine and a half. Why? Because she's mad. 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 Why? Because she's
but she wants you to really put it away and start studying, right? And then she goes nine and three quarters and she is going coming into the <laughs> room and you throw your game away and pick up your biology book and tur turn it into the pretend to study. And your mom's like, okay, finally you're studying. All right. Okay, I, I thought I needed to smack you. Okay, so thank you for doing that. And she goes down. And uh, the reason God sent the prophets on the way to the Israelites. Why did why did God send the prophets? Why did He uh, deliver His message to to the Israelites through the judges? Is because He doesn't want to punish the Israelites. And the reason we're talking about this is because it's not just about Israelites' history. It's relevant to us as God's creation. Because God created each one of us and He wants to bless us. He doesn't want to curse us. He doesn't want to punish us. He's the loving Father. He does not, He wants to bless us and love us and forgive us. He is very, very forgiving and compassionate. And He empathizes with uh, every weakness and every problem that we have. He's not an ignorant God. He's not, he's not a cold God, distant God. He's a very, very intimate and loving God. However, if there's any sin in us, because he's the righteous judge, he is the holy God, he cannot stand that sin, and he has to punish that sin. And he doesn't, he's in dilemma. All right, so Israelites, come on, behave, behave. I just told you to put away your game and start studying, but why are you not doing it? And so finally, he has to come and smack them a few times. And then they're like, oh, oh we're, like, we're smacked by uh, other tribes, like other Foreign tribes come and invade us and rob us and take away our people and torture us. That's the punishment. Um, and then when, when they finally cry, the Gideon, Gideon cried out to the Lord, If you are with us, why are we under the oppression of the uh, Midianites? <clears throat> it's because you misbehaved. You didn't listen to me. That's why the Midianites came and conquered. Okay, Lord, we repent. Please uh, give us the victory so that we can have peace. Then, okay, so, so then, then you need to act up. You need to change your behavior. So you have to change your attitude. Obey me. Then I will give you victory. And that's what the Israelites did. They finally obeyed. And God took away the battles. And he, he let them win. And there was a, a ceasefire. There was a peace in, the, in that land. And so, um, why are these stories of Israelites of sin against God in the Bible. Like the book of Judges, when you read it, it's kind of it's really fun. There are many different stories. I read about like Deborah and Samson. Uh, there are movies that came out of that, right? However, it looks terrible. Like it looks like it, it's a cycle of Israelites sin against God and they get punished and they repent and you know they sin against God again, get punished, repent. So why are there the stories in the Bible? It's just like you, just like you said. Um, I forget your name again. Helena. 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 I just mentioned. Uh, it's about uh, obedience. So uh, when we are children, we sometimes don't understand why our parents are after us. You know, why are they saying like curfews? So they come back home before whatever time. You know, why are you saying don't go out and play with it? Why do you not give us? Give me the car so that I can drive around, you know? Or uh, why do you give, not give me the, you know, you know, the money that I need, you know? Um, sometimes we're like, why do you keep saying study? You know, I don't want to study, you know, all that stuff. Sometimes we don't understand because uh, the message of obedience is not something popular. Like, I'm sick and tired of being told what to do, you know? But that's not what God is saying. Why is God saying all this? It's because he understands that we have the sinful nature. He wants us to be restored to the love relationship so that we can be blessed and have life instead of death and punishment. And so it's for our own good. It's ultimately out of his love for us. And that's why he's giving us so many messages. Um, and so if we can understand his heart, uh, which can be done when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And um, if you read the Bible carefully, uh, you, can, you can see how much God loves us. Um, and 
that love cannot be comparable to any other kind of love that we have experienced um, because he's the source of love. He, he created that concept of love, the power of love. He's the origin of the power of love. So if we had good, good parents, good father, good mother, or uh, if we have a good, good spouse, or if we have a, I don't know, good girlfriend, like the best one that, that we've ever had, um, his love is even better than that because he's the one who actually um, gave us that concept. Um, and so I want you to go, out, go home and uh, um, kind of think about who the Mashiach is, Jesus as the source of love. Um, this coming week is, uh, this coming Sunday is Easter. That's when Jesus died and rose again from the dead. And we're celebrating his resurrection. And like, like I said at the beginning of the class, um, Jesus said, I am the life and the resurrection. So while living on this earth, if we believe him as Mashiach, he and come into the relationship with him, in the areas where we feel hopeless, darkness, you know, uh, whatever the situation and problem is, he's going to come and give you hope. And he's going to turn things around. He's going to give you something better um, because he's the life and resurrection. And when we physically die, you know that there's a resurrection of everyone. And so I want you to kind of uh, remember that throughout this week as we um, come to face um, Easter because it's, Easter is more than uh, chocolates and bunnies and eggs. You know? <laughs> Although that's fun, uh, the real meaning of Easter is uh, Resurrection Sunday, uh, where Jesus rose again from the dead. And so um, I want to bless you. Um, go home in peace. And um, yeah, come back next time. Please be on time uh, so that you know we can be considered for other people who we'll have come. Um, it, it's not fair if you come in late and kind of disturb other people, right? So let's uh, try to make it in time um, so that uh, we can we don't run out of time. All right? Yeah. Thank you for your active participation today. All right. Go home. Thank you. We'll see you next week.